Recently, we went back down to the U.S.-Mexico border to visit McAllen, Texas. Now, if you guys recall, it was two years ago that we went down there and we spoke to the emergency manager who gave us some very surprising news. Now, I'm just curious as to what point these people come in contact with the Border Patrol. Do you know? Originally? Yes. You'd have to ask them. It's the only ones that you'll see here are family units mm -hmm. that are like a mom and a couple of kids that they have determined don't pose any sort of security risk and right. don't have a criminal background and they've got relatives or um, help somewhere in the interior. Mm -hmm. So that category of people, again, as our understanding, they provide them a ticket right? and then they drop The Border Patrol person. provides them a ticket? That's what we were told and that's what I understood, but obviously some of them didn't. Or, or they're arranging tickets with them there, There's you know what I mean, with a relative that's paying for something, I don't know. And that was two years ago. Now, since then, more news outlets have gotten around to reporting it, and I say better late than never. But this time around, we spoke to a Border Patrol vice president who also gave us some very uh, intriguing intel. He was telling us about the numbers of people that, they were, that were coming over the border, uh, how frequently they picked them up, pretty much on a routine basis. He said you can go out there two or three times a day, and they just do a sweep, and they pick up large groups of people. And here's what he had to say. On a general, let's say a month, uh, what type of drugs do you encounter and what quantities? Uh, the, the most common is marijuana. We see thousands upon thousands of pounds weekly. Um, we do see a lot of cocaine. We see, we're starting to see heroin and meth a lot more. Usually those were reserved for the ports of entry, but now they started running those across the river as well. Okay. And as far as the people coming over, are your agents encountering any type of uh, infectious diseases, people with illnesses as they cross the border? Oh, most definitely. We see a tuberculosis pretty regularly, um, scabies. Um, more often than not, we have large amounts of uh, infectious diseases as far as scabies go. And the interesting part with that is it's, it's not actually um, seen on the body during the infectious period. And so these people clear through our system and then they go into the, the rest of the country with that disease. Uh, we see a lot of uh, measles, a lot of chicken pox, um, a lot of unidentified illnesses that, that you know, a lot of uh, lung infections that we have no idea what they are. And again, that's just what we catch. Right. Okay, now we've seen reports of the quarantine facilities uh, at your Border Patrol stations. Some reports saying that they're just a piece of yellow tape. Since then, has the situation improved at all? No, not at all. You know, we do still have the yellow tape. Uh, sometimes they use a red tape. I don't know if there's any significance there. Um, we do have uh, nurses and doctors that are on staff that are there, but as far as a quarantine facility or an actual um, method of, of treating these people and, and, uh, and, and really quarantining them so it doesn't spread, we don't have that. So with this knowledge in hand, we decided to go down to the border ourselves, and we were probably out there maybe an hour or so before a raft started to float across from the Mexico side and come here to the U.S. side. And we were driving around, and we encountered multiple Border Patrol agents, also people there from the Wildlife Preserve who were very interested in our activities, saying, what are you guys doing out here? We said, well, we're just reporters from Austin, Texas, and we want to report on what's happening out here. And it was a very interesting situation because uh, even though they had no clear signs posted, they kept telling us that we we're on private land. I'm like, well, where does it begin and end? When you drive in, uh, I guess, to the private land, as they keep saying it was, there was no overt sign saying that you're entering federal property or a uh, wildlife preserve or anything to that notion, but regardless, I, I digress. So we're driving around and we're wondering where this group of people went, you know, where do they go? Uh, were they contacted by Border Patrol? And while we were driving around, we actually saw people in the back of a Border Patrol truck, I guess they had recently been picked up. And while we were doing our rounds, we actually ran into a family. And here's what happened when our reporter, Don Salazar, had a chance to speak to them. Uh, todos, uh, Are you from Mexico? Mexico? Uh, El Salvador. El Salvador. Yeah, El Salvador. Okay. Everyone? To todos? Todos. Yes. Todos we came together. Okay. Ah, tanto, uh, How long was your journey to get here? Hey, como it took us meses. two months. We were working and working on the way up until we got here, where we're at. We just want to complete the journey. But we're already tired and thirsty and hungry. Eventually we'll get where we want to go, but it's getting impossible. Kind of hot out here. Want to drink some water? 
And that was just on day one. We decided to go back a second day in like the first day, we ran into a lot of officers out there very inquisitive about our activities. And while they're questioning us, a raft comes across from the Mexico side to the US side. And if you look real close to this footage, you can actually see a guy jump out of the boat and swim back to the Mexico side. I'm not exactly sure what his motivation was in doing that, but it definitely did happen. And it's not just people coming over the border. They have drugs, of course, the issue of human trafficking, all these other things that the Border Patrol have to deal with. And long story short, if you take the interviews we did with the emergency manager or the Border Patrol agents or the ICE agents when we, when we went out there two years ago, the main consensus between all those people is at some point, the focal point goes back to the McAllen bus station. Uh, now, this is where it gets a little, a little dicey. Not everybody agrees on how the people are provided with their travel vouchers, but they pretty much agree that they get some type of funding or a ticket courtesy of somebody else to travel around the United States of America, because the people we met came from El Salvador, and whatever provisions they left with ran out a very long time ago. So they had no food, no water. I'm sure if they had any money, they had spent it by that point just to get there. They had been traveling for two months, a very long journey. Um, the group we saw was about 20 people, men, well, one man, if I recall correctly, and also mostly women and children. So the only thing they had at their point at the point was the clothes on their back. So somebody is providing these people with travel vouchers. So they go to the McAllen bus station. There's also a church nearby. They help them out with food, clothing, uh, maybe put a little money in their pocket possibly, and then they go about in the country. And the big issue with this is that when these people are sent around, around the country, very few of them come back for the actual court hearing, for the immigration hearing. And why would you? You travel two months, you're not gonna go all the way back to McAllen, Texas, just so you can be uh, you know, sent back to wherever you came from. And one of the things to note about this is the people we talked to, the Border Patrol agents or whoever else, they told us that when people come from Mexico, they usually just send them back across the border, uh, pretty much a catch and release type of program. But when they come from further away, such as El Salvador, Guatemala, someplace like that, they're allowed to stay temporarily, you know, uh, pending their court hearing, as I already stated, very few people show up to. So this is the thing that's going on at the border. And while we do know this is going on, it's always somewhat in our mind. And just think about this as sad as these stories are to see these people who come all the way from Guatemala or wherever else they may be coming from, what are the situations in their country that are forcing them to leave? Because it's not just people coming from Latin America, people are coming from Syria, people are coming from China, as the Border Patrolman told us in our interview. And also we know the people who are coming from Central, South America, are you getting people from other countries as well? Most, yeah, most definitely. We're getting, um, you name it, we're getting them, Chinese, India, uh, the Middle East, um, all over. We, if they're out there, they're coming through this southern border. And when you think about people coming from these foreign countries, if I lived in Pakistan or I lived in Syria or some other place, uh, Yemen, where they have these routine drone strikes, you know, blowing up hospitals and churches, blowing up wedding parties, I'd probably want to move out of there too. So let's just say for the sake of argument, we do put out blanket amnesty, make everybody currently here a United States citizen. What are we going to do tomorrow to stop people from coming here. And a lot of people would be happy to stay in their own country if they had a steady economy or they didn't have to worry about war or famine or, or these other things that are going on around the world. I think that's a much larger issue that needs to be addressed, just like the issue of immigration. You can find more reports on Infowars.com.